the Wall Street protests that are entering their third week in New York are now spreading to other cities. While Egyptian protests divide the country and threaten stability. In Hundred cities across Brazil have seen a fresh wave of mass protests. Demonstrators accuse the leaders of the world's largest economies of turning a blind eye to the problems of those who are in need. More than 10,000 people have marched to Nice to protest against the G20 summit. Back here at home, many viewers have little idea of how large or how serious these revolts really are. People are waking up. They're in the streets, they're educating themselves, and they are demanding change. It seems the days of the quiet citizen are becoming numbered as more and more grow tired of our current ways. In 2011, Time Magazine gave Person of the Year to the protester. As they stated in the cover story themselves, massive and effective street protest was a global oxymoron until suddenly, shockingly, starting exactly a year ago, it became the defining trope of our times, and the protester once again became a maker of history. Since the year 2000, millions protested in over 100 countries around the world for reasons ranging from the economy to 9-11 truth. In some cases, peaceful protests even led to the overthrowing of governments in power. To name some of the notable protests, in 2010 and 2011, over 600,000 protested in Greece against new austerity measures. The Greek people were unhappy with unemployment and the state of the economy and decided to take their displeasure to the streets. In 2011, the Occupy movement sprung up, bringing out hundreds of thousands from more than 95 countries, raising awareness about wealth inequality, political corruption, and corporate influence over government. Also in 2011, over 6 million marched in Spain due to political and financial unrest. This was a month-long protest. Continuing the trend in 2011, the Egyptians revolted against election fraud and other socio-economic factors. Millions took to the streets and effectively overthrew their government. In 2013, the Egyptians were at it again, this time protesting over economic and security issues. They once again successfully overthrew their government to bring about change. 2013 also saw a huge uprising in Turkey, where protesters demanded the protection of Gezi Park and hoped to raise awareness about police brutality, freedom of speech, and to push their government to resign. The Turkish people were successful in protecting the park, and some police officers were dismissed after investigation revealed extensive bouts of brutality. 2013 was also home to the March Against Monsanto. It featured over 2 million people from 52 countries. The goal was to raise awareness about genetically modified foods and GMO labeling. Protesters wanted citizens to have the right to know if they are buying GMO products by having them labeled. These are just some of the unprecedented amount of protests that have taken place in the last few years. This isn't to say that protesting is the answer to the world's issues, but we are seeing clear signs of people getting fed up with how things are. The general population is standing up for themselves and demanding change. Protesting is not the only sign that people are getting antsy. The internet and social media have been riddled with websites, Facebook pages, and campaigns all geared towards raising awareness and bringing about change. Popular content includes environmental issues, healthcare, food supply, political corruption, financial corruption, religious corruption, 9-11 truth, the ruling elite, military industrial complex, UFOs, wars, and more. The popularity of this content is undeniable, as many websites featuring this content are amongst the biggest in the world. Hundreds of millions are engaging in this content every day as people are seeing things more and more clearly. The question is, what is happening here and what does it all mean? We've been on a journey for the past two years to find out what is going on with the world and how it affects us all. Are we in the midst of a major revolution? A shift in consciousness? If so, what is causing all of it? And what role does each one of us play? What we found out was nothing short of amazing.
cross promotes their site anyway. Right. But, uh, other than that, the content's pretty good for this one. Good. So it should be a good month then. Yeah. Nothing good. Okay. Bunch of ads. Collective Evolution started during a time when people were really looking to understand themselves more spiritually. At the same time, there was a general feeling that people wanted to understand what was truly going on within the world and how it functioned. Uh, for me, it was always a big passion of mine to look into this stuff and to understand it further as I was going through a lot of these shifts myself. So, you know, getting Collective Evolution going and really pushing it to uh, spread as far across the world as possible was something that kind of came naturally to me. Uh, it started in about 2009, so that was probably about four years ago now. A few years ago, I recognized that um, what I was seeing happening in the world around me did not resonate with me. Um, there were a lot of things that I wanted to change, and I recognized that there was a big global movement happening, a paradigm shift. Um, the consciousness of the planet was changing, and I really wanted to be a contributing part to that. And I met the CE team, and been doing this ever since. My awakening really began in 2007 when I saw the documentary called Zeitgeist. Um, from that point forward, I began to research everything, trying to find out the truth behind everything. That's when I came across Collective Evolution. I joined the CE team in 2010, and since then I've began to take an active role in changing myself, as well as the societal structures that are in place today. A lot of what actually brought me here was kind of a discomfort that started to rise up. What started as like a little discomfort quickly grew into a push, a push to try and change things, to do things that were outside of my box, to do things that I maybe didn't feel comfortable doing before. What started as one little change quickly rippled out and became a whole bunch of things unfolding. And one of those things was coming across Collective Evolution and meeting Joe and some of the other guys that were on the team at the time. Since that point, Collective Evolution has kind of become for me a medium to share what I've already been doing, what I've already been going through, but to do it in a way that other people can be a part of it as well. I guess my journey started about four years ago when I was embedded into the educational system. I began to feel a little bit lost and, I, and unhappy and I began to realize that the systems in place didn't resonate with me and hence began my spiritual awakening. Fast forward to a couple years later and I just recently joined the Collective Evolution team because I feel like right now is a crucial time to be taking an active role in the global paradigm shift taking place. I think anyone who works with CE can kind of say the same thing about you know, their lives and what led them here. In a sense, we didn't want to continue, I guess, um, just seeing the world the way it was. We wanted to change things. We wanted to do things differently. And so CE is important to us because it allows us to not only share different ideas and different opinions and, and get it out there, but also encourage others to kind of think about it as well and, and join in conversation that really gets people thinking about how we can actually start changing things in the world. It's like for a lot of the, the common things that you'll get in a lot of the messages that people send is, is you'll see like, I feel like I'm alone. I feel like I'm the only one realizing this. I feel like, what can I do? The fact that so many people are saying that shows how many people are actually going through this, how many people are actually feeling a push to do something or seeking out the information. In the previous work we had done, we looked at the corruption side of things as well as the metaphysical or, or spiritual side of things. And we were left with this glaring question, you know, how do we put it all together in a way that's really understandable and graspable by people so we can start to take action on it? And that's kind of where the, the journey begins here is when we looked back at the beginning of the story, kind of where it all starts, not just for us, but for other people as this movement continues to expand, um, the connection that seems to exist between everybody is that a lot of times it starts with a single event and that event is 9-11. When the planes hit the towers on the morning of September 11th, 2001, not only did the people begin to fear the terrorist, but many were asking how an event like this could have happened. Within hours, the media was revealing to the world that a group of terrorists armed with box cutters hijacked three planes and flew one into each Trade Center tower and one into the Pentagon. People were stunned. Months later, the unthinkable happened. People began questioning the official story their government had supplied for them. I mean, right after 
9-11. We had the 9-11 commission. Everyone pretty much, you know, just approved of it because you don't question 9-11. But as time went on and, and people just broke everything down and shared it with people, it became a major force of people waking up and being able to see the other side of the story that they would never get. For a while, the media and government deemed anyone who questioned the story a conspiracy theorist. Let us never tolerate outrageous conspiracy theories concerning the attacks of September the 11th. Malicious lies that attempt to shift the blame away from the terrorists themselves. Well, just living here in New York City during 9-11, it was a hugely just emotional event that just hit everyone extremely hard. It's one of those events where everything just goes out the door and everything is based on emotions. I mean, that's why here in New York City and pretty much all over the United States and even all over the world, the only thing we saw on television for weeks and just forever is just towers coming down and death and destruction. And then, you know, Arabs. Death, destruction, Arabs. That thing, that what happened on 9-11, it affected everyone around the world. Everyone knows where, where they were when 9-11 happened. I know where I was on 9-11. And it had such a huge effect and that it just blinded people. It blinded me. It made me want to join the military when I was here. I went to the recruiting station because I was here. I, I you know, the dust was in my neighborhood. You could write your name in and, and cars. You know, dust that was filled with asbestos. So waking people up was extremely difficult, especially early on. But as time went on, 9-11 really became such an important event that people always kept their minds on it. And they more, the more they thought about it, the more that it was in their conscious, the more they started asking questions. And those questions were extremely important. Who knew what? Why did it happen? What else happened that we don't know about? Why are these questions not being answered? And that to me sparked an outrage when people knew they were being lied to. In 2002, the New York Times ran a public opinion poll asking whether the Bush administration had prior knowledge of the attacks on 9-11 and if they were completely telling the truth about what happened that day. The poll results were rather interesting. The responses from May 2002 indicated that only 21% felt they were telling the truth. 65% felt they were mostly telling the truth but hiding something. 8% felt they were mostly lying and 6% were not sure at all. By 2006, as more information was being revealed by the public, responses changed even further. 16% felt they were telling the truth. 53% felt they were mostly telling the truth, but hiding something. 28% felt that they were mostly lying, and 3% were not sure. A Zogby poll revealed that half of New Yorkers believed the US leaders had foreknowledge of the impending 9-11 attacks and consciously failed to act. A CNN poll in 2004 indicated that 89% believe the U.S. government is covering up details about 9-11. A Canadian poll conducted by AM640 News in 2006 indicated that 85% of Canadians believe 9-11 was an inside job. A 2007 poll conducted in India, the world's second most populous country, found that only two out of every five people in India believe that Al-Qaeda is responsible for the 9-11 attacks. A poll taken by the World Public Opinion polled over 16,000 people in 17 nations outside of the United States during the summer of 2008. They found that majorities in only nine of the 17 countries believe Al-Qaeda carried out the attacks. It appears the public was having a change in opinion as they learned more information about 9-11. The numbers paint a clear picture of the people's opinion about 9-11. Regardless of how the media has presented the story, many are not blindly following what their governments want them to believe about 9-11. People have chosen to think for themselves and conduct their own research. 
This has led them to fascinating discoveries about what might really have happened on 9-11. But public opinion is not enough to make a case, and so we turn to a group called Architects and Engineers for 9-11 Truth. This is a group of over 1,500 architects and engineers from around the world who formed to analyze the events of 9-11 in great detail. What they found was that the official story released by the 9-11 Commission contained physically and technically impossible events. Through examining rubble, structures, building plans, site chemistry, and more, it became utterly conclusive that the official story was false. The number of architects and engineers who support these realizations is growing every year. This further proved what citizens were feeling in that their government was lying to them. If they were lying about 9-11, what else might they be lying about and why? As protests took place in countries all around the world, there were some that got a lot of media attention and some that didn't. Possibly one of the most successful protests in the past decade took place in Iceland during the years 2008 and 2009. What the people of Iceland achieved through their actions is perhaps why there was so little coverage of the protests. The story starts in the year 2000 when massive deregulation measures were taken that basically destroyed the quiet, high standard of living and beautiful country that Iceland was. One of the major moves taken at the time was the privatization of the three largest local banks in Iceland, who in the history of their existence never needed to operate outside of their own country. Once privatized, over a period of five years, these three tiny banks borrowed $120 billion. That was 10 times the size of Iceland's economy. These private bankers went on a massive spending spree, buying up luxuries, businesses, and assets that they didn't need. It didn't take much time for a massive stock and housing bubble to be created, and at the end of 2008, during the worldwide economic downturn, Iceland's banks collapsed in a one-week period. Everybody in Iceland felt the effects of this crash, and many had lost all of their savings. Protests broke out in Iceland as people were demanding a change in government due to what they allowed to happen. From October 2008 to January 2009, these protests continued until the Iceland government finally resigned. While it is unclear why exactly they resigned, the peaceful protests achieved precisely what the citizens wanted it to. The years that followed the resignation saw positive results for the country as they worked their way back to nearly zero deficit. Unemployment numbers lowered and measures were put in place to make the system more fair for citizens. People were pleased. Was this all the result of peaceful protests? Can humanity use this example as a means to begin making change in their own countries? One clear trend taking place is united social action in the form of protesting. These demonstrations raise a lot of awareness around key issues going on around the world. But there seems to be something else going on that is making its way across the entire planet. What some are calling a spiritual awakening or a shift in consciousness seems to be happening at an ever quickening pace. People are suddenly feeling more connected with themselves, with each other and with the planet. They're inspired to change aspects of themselves and they're doing something about it. What is this shift or awakening all about? And is there any relation to the social uprising that we are seeing?
In the last few years, there probably about the last 10 years. I mean, if we focus on that as as our our viewpoint, where we're looking from, just in the last 10 years, we can clearly see that the way people are viewing life is very very different, and the consciousness of a spiritual understanding of who we are, where we're from, and where we're going. Those three things is guiding the planet on the concept of what is our purpose? What is it that we're meant to be doing here? I feel personally that that awakening is something that is a long time coming. Uh, I feel that this is something that has been thrust upon many of us in a spontaneous nature that many just don't seem to understand what's happening. The old ways aren't working anymore. The egoic structures, the, the uh, putting uh, people as commodity, as something expendable, the, the ends don't justify the means. We have to uh, care about each other and that hasn't been the top priority. I think that people are becoming more aware that we have to end um, this thoughtless environmental degradation, that the way that we're living is just not sustainable anymore, that we're losing land mass, we're losing water, we're losing species, um, we're losing humans. Um, we're, we're actually, we're heading, we're heading toward extinction. As a, I mean, as a planet, we're actually heading toward species extinction. So the first thing that happens is, you know, we start to realize, wait a minute, somebody else dictating how our life is. We're starting to look at things and saying, well, you know, this doesn't need to be this way. I think that uh, we're kind of um, in a time of transition between two world, world, world views or two kind of uh, forms or, or um, you know, levels of consciousness. And uh, we're seeing the disintegration of the old worldview, the old structure of consciousness, the old form of civilization, while the new one hasn't fully, uh, you know, constellated itself uh, so clearly yet, except to maybe, uh, you know, a, a small group. You know. uh, whether it be a political awakening, whether it be a spiritual awakening, a psychological awakening, or the ability to let go of old uh, harmful. Uh, uh, thought paradigms or thinking habits or behavioral habits. This gives us the opportunity right now to really look fearlessly at our lives, look fearlessly at the world as it is, and uh, feel and see the new paradigm um, a little clearer. The soul wants to move on. It's experienced lack and limitation enough. Like we know what it's like to compete with each other, to fight, to, I can't give you any of mine because there'll be less for me. We've played that game. It's time to play a new game. The shift in consciousness is not necessarily a new idea. While more current and updated information exists today, the topic has been talked about since ancient cultures began foretelling the idea. Possibly the most famous now is the foretellings of the Mayans. Much of what the Mayans shared had to do with cycles and world ages. Even back then, they had a very deep and detailed understanding of how complicated astrological cycles functioned. The planet, the solar system, is going through a part of the universe um, and even the, gal the galaxy is going through a part of the universe that um, is very, how would I describe it, more like there's particles of infinite possibility that we're going through. And it's just a little section of whatever, you know, the cosmos or whatever that we're going through, a little, a little area. And that means that a, 
planetary level that we can shift, we can create something new, we can have a different experience at a physical level. This is kind of a physical alignment of all the planets, and each planet streams different uh, frequencies. We had an alignment that occurred with, you know, our central galactic sun, our sun's uh, frequency changed. Everything created a whole sequence to prepare for this new cycle. With a solar system as uh, aligning with other galactic um, energies that are out there, and it's almost as if uh, everything is falling into place to make it the perfect moment to have this type of awakening happening. Today, we are able to confirm the existence of these cycles through advanced technology that was non-existent back then. Many of us are familiar with several astrological cycles, as we can visually see them. One of these cycles is that of a single day, which is about 24 hours. This is the amount of time it takes for the Earth to rotate once on its axis. We are also familiar with the cycle of a month. This is a 28-day cycle in which the Moon travels one time all the way around the Earth. Next we have the cycle of a year, which is about 365 days. This is how long the Earth takes to travel once around the Sun. However, some galactic cycles are much more difficult to observe as they require many years to fully realize them. One of those cycles is the precession of the equinox. This takes approximately 26,000 years to complete. This cycle refers to a wobble in the Earth's axis as it rotates. It takes about 26,000 years before the Earth's axis points in the same direction once again. The fact that the Maya were aware of these cycles back then is astounding considering they did not have the technologies that we have today. The Maya also spoke of a cycle that lasts 5125 years. This cycle is possibly the most important to us because one of these cycles ended on December 21st, 2012, marking the birth of a new one. The Maya referred to these cycles as world ages. Although, I, I mean, I wrote a book called 2012, The Return of Tetzel Quaddle. I also made a film, 2012 Time for Change, a documentary. But neither in the book or the film did we claim that anything drastic or traumatic or amazing or epiphanic was going to happen on the actual date. Uh, we saw it more as the, the hinge point in a larger cultural process, a larger process of transformation. And I think if we, you know, uh, if we look around that time, um, you know, we can see tremendous changes are happening whether it's Fukushima or Occupy or the Arab Spring or the development of a you know, global communications infrastructure that allows for new ideas and so on to move around the world instantly. Um, I think it's clear that we are in a prophetic time of transformation. According to the Mayans, there have been at least four previous world ages and that on December 21st, 2012, we ended yet another world cycle and began a new one. To the Maya, each age moves the Earth and universe to spiral higher in consciousness. Simply put, they believe that humanity's values, beliefs, ways of operating, and spiritual understandings evolve with each age, bringing a new, higher level of understanding. My final kind of understanding of what is meant by a world, uh, you know, whether in uh, the way the Mayans and the Aztecs discuss it, or Western occult uh, philosophers like Rudolf Steiner kind of discuss it, is that it represents kind of a, a, a whole structure of consciousness um, that includes like a relationship to time and space, um, a relationship to mythology and so on. And, um, you know, as I said earlier, I think that we're on this, we're in, the, we're in this uh, transition between worldviews, the alienated, uh, materialistic uh, worldview of the last few centuries, uh, you know, which really began in the 17th century and has antecedents going back to the origin of the Christian era and so on, um, is breaking down. Uh, and in its wake is going to come into play something that like this philosopher, Austrian philosopher Gene Gebser talked about as the uh, an integral worldview. We're shifting from a, one state of consciousness to another a state of consciousness. Now, as experiencers that we are projecting ourselves on different planets, we do use the updating of our experiences. So when we're, we're creating a shift, we're actually restaging our whole experience. So at this time, the shift uh, is a, an upgrade that we are going through. It's an upgrade in consciousness, 
And in the consciousness upgrade, we actually look at things differently, we feel differently about things, and we actually create a more powerful connection with the essence of who we are in when we're having this experience. So we're no longer seeing ourselves uh, in the way that we have over the thousands and thousands of years where we just saw ourselves as a physical form. Now we're also bringing in another consciousness of understanding that we're much more than the physical form having a human experience. So as we are, we're going through this now, that will create a complete transformation of how we see things and experience things. So our world starts to reflect that. And today, and there, is, it, there seems to be a, a split between those who are really stepping into an understanding that our purpose here is to be interconnected and to have that knowledge of being interconnected with the natural world and with each other. Following this belief, a new world age would bring transformation to humanity in a conscious and spiritual way that is unprecedented. What is even more interesting is that the Mayan belief of great world ages coincides with the Egyptian belief in the age of Aquarius. To the Egyptians, what they called the Piscean Age would end in 2012 and the new Age of Aquarius would begin. They believed this age would encourage physical and spiritual transformation. So the hallmark of what people call the Aquarian Age to me is the time when you move from using your mind to figure things out to using your intuition to know in each moment what it is you need to do and what's happening at that moment. And that change is a big change because people have been working linearly for a long time. Of course, we cannot say for certain that what the Mayans and Egyptians were talking about is precisely what is happening now. However, many signs are pointing in that direction, and it is very likely that we can use their foretelling as a tool to help us understand what is happening today. By understanding this, we can begin to make sense of what appears to be one of the greatest transformations humanity has ever experienced. What did the Mayans mean when they spoke of consciousness or when they spoke of changes? How can a new world age actually affect us? To understand this, we need to learn a little bit more about the true nature of our reality. To do that, we need to look into one of the deepest understandings we have about our current reality, quantum physics. Generally, when we look at objects, we see them as they are. A table, a pencil, a car. Some of us even know that when we look at these objects under a fine microscope, we see electrons and atoms moving around. But when we look at these objects on a level even deeper than the electron, we see pure, vibrating, and pulsating energy or life force. No matter what we look at in our world and in our universe, we discover the same thing, that everything is made up of this same vibrating energy. Even more interestingly, quantum physics is showing us that all of the energy that exists in the universe is all interconnected and is affected by actions that take place in the universe, whether it be cosmic or human related. There also have been some great scientists who have done experimental work in exploring the nature of consciousness, the nature of subtle energies that, that, that interact with each other instantaneously throughout the universe. And we know even in quantum physics, the phenomenon of non-locality, where action at a distance can happen 
between two particles that are widely separated physically, but yet are interconnected instantaneously. This can be best described by what Einstein called spooky action at a distance, also known as entanglement. If you take two electrons that were created together and separate them at a very far distance, when you do something to one of them, the other responds instantly. This is because they are still connected. All energy, or all things, is infinite potential at all times and is always connected. While it is not important that we understand this concept deeply, it is important to realize that everything in our universe is made up of the exact same energy and is always connected. So when it is said that everything is energy, what is really being said is that to the naked eye, although things seem solid and are solid, at their deepest observable level, they are vibrating energy and this energy is interconnected throughout the entire universe. This is important to understand because what may be causing the social uprising and change we are seeing today deals directly with energy and its frequency. I mean, it seems like the, the last, uh, you know, the last couple centuries is actually Western science catching up to Eastern mysticism and, and actually kind of uh, experientially demonstrating, you know, these ancient, what these ancient texts of Buddhism and Vedantic philosophy have said for thousands of years. Uh, you know, which is that, you know, underlying the manifestations of the physical reality, there's a kind of infinite source of consciousness uh, that, that's, uh, you know, expressing itself uh, through, you know, the, these kind of uh, material forms. You know? And so, yeah, I mean, I think that um, there's, a, there's obviously still a major kind of uh, resistance on the part of mainstream thinkers to except that, uh, you know, the, that the discoveries of quantum physicists of the 20th century, uh, you know, like John Archibald Wheeler and David Bohm, are, are so much, con are so congruent, so much in support of Eastern mysticism, because it once again kind of destroys the, the Western paradigm, which is based on duality and separation. But that's partially the, the, the shift that we have to make, or, or essentially. One of the most influential energetic forces we experience on the planet today is familiar to all of us. It is our sun. The sun has been worshipped for thousands of years. It is the bringer of light, the giver of life, and it keeps us all from freezing here on Earth. One thing we don't think of when it comes to the sun, however, is its effects on human consciousness or how we perceive the world. Since with quantum physics, we understand that everything is energy and everything is essentially frequency, we can see more clearly how radiation and energy from the sun can have an effect on Earth and its inhabitants. So how exactly does this happen? We have all heard at one point or another that the sun releases solar flares. A solar flare is a large energy release from the sun's surface. Typically, the flare releases about one-sixth of the total energy the sun outputs in a single second. The flare ejects clouds of electrons, ions, and atoms through its corona into space. These energy-filled clouds would typically reach Earth a day or two after the flare occurs.
But how does a solar flare from the sun affect humanity? And how can this really be related to the changes taking place on the planet right now? Today we understand that the sun goes through cycles. One of these cycles is called the sunspot cycle. This cycle lasts about 11 years and generally features one solar maximum. The solar maximum is defined as the period within the 11-year cycle where the sun's radiation is at its peak. NASA confirmed the beginning of the 24th solar cycle in January of 2008. This is the cycle we are currently in. The sun goes through 11-year uh, cycles where its magnetic field reverses. And it's going through, before that, there are a lot of abundant solar flares. And we're witnessing that right now. Very, even this week, there have been reports of uh, outstanding solar flares that are likely to affect um, satellites and our power systems on the planet, but also affect us consciously. The work of Russian scientist Alexander Chizevsky is where we begin to see the astounding relationship that exists between our sun and human consciousness. When I first came across Chachevsky's research, it was fascinating because you're seeing thousands of years worth of, of human history and human events that seem to coincide almost perfectly with the cycles of the sun and, and the radiation and the cosmic rays that are coming down cosmologically that, that ultimately are impacting human consciousness and, and the events that take place here on Earth. After analyzing years of data, Chizevsky discovered that there was a direct correlation between sunspot cycles and many major events in human history. Whether it was wars, revolutions, social reforms, insurrections, peace, or the rise of new leaders, there was a clear link between sunspot cycles and the time of these events. The cycle of solar flares correlates with the cycles of, of human disorder and distress. Uh, wars, revolutions, crime uh, reaches peaks during the peaks of uh, solar activity, of solar flares. When Chizevsky's work was continued by Professor Raymond Wheeler from the University of Kansas, it was confirmed that Chizevsky's model continued to produce accurate results. During the maxima in 1990, the war in Iraq had begun, and during the maxima of 2001, the World Trade Center towers were taken down on 9-11. Professor Tijewski uh, had the audacity to correlate the Russian Revolution with one of the solar flare activity, so they jailed him for 30 years. He was banished because he uh, pointed out that there were subtle effects that may have caused the Russian Revolution rather than uh, the, the events that they, they would like to have thought they brought about their own revolution. Considering the maxima we are currently in, what might we expect to see? For this, we can look into Chizevsky's realization of four main periods within each sunspot cycle. Within each 11-year cycle, Chizevsky recognized three years of minimum excitability, two years of growth and excitability, three years of maximum excitability, and three years of a decline in excitability. Interestingly, we see specific characteristics for each period. The first period is characterized by a lack of unity in the masses, indifference in the masses, and tolerance in the masses. About 5% of major historical events occurred during this period. The second period is characterized by the originating of new ideas, the push to centralize around an idea, and features beginnings of uniting within the masses. 20% of major events happen during this time. The third period is characterized by the discovery of solutions to the greatest issues at hand. The masses become more impatient with the status quo and the masses become united together for a common goal. 60% of major events happen during this time. The final period is characterized by the masses pushing for the last bits of change before things calm down once again. Peace often becomes more prominent during this period. 
15% of major events happen during this time. As you may have guessed, we are currently in the third period. The universe is conscious, you know, and we embody a certain form of consciousness. You know, maybe the planets themselves also do. Maybe the sun is, is uh, you know, a much more developed form of consciousness, and it actually evolves uh, physical life, biological life, as well as uh, the evolution of uh, sentience on our world through uh, solar rays, you know, and maybe it gets direct. This was Jose Aguilas' whole concept. Maybe even gets ideas, you know, get, gets, gets uh, you know, transmissions from the center of the galaxy, transduces that information into solar rays, beams them at the Earth. So yeah, so I think there's probably a tremendous interplay between uh, the Sun, Earth as a system, uh, and the cosmic rays and the solar rays are part of that. I mean, um, there's also that whole idea of uh, Dimitriovs, right? Around how like the whole solar system is, uh, is is evolving as a system, and it's undergoing. We we moved in through a different region of the galaxy, so we're now going through like a rapid energetic shift. The the, the radiation, the frequency that the, our sun is uh, emitting now, has increased. And there's a couple of things that happen there, because one one thing is that it's increased. In, in a sense, so that it actually carries new spectrums of light and uh, new uh, higher frequencies that are being specifically used to transform not only our consciousness, our physicality, and everything that's on the, on the planet itself. So it, it, it does play a very, very powerful role that's going on right now. And this is why you know, people are looking at uh, a lot of the researchers and so forth are looking at how things are moving in, in, um, in our, uh, when we're looking into the astronomy part of it and how things are all aligning with the planets and, and uh, of course the bursts that we're getting now. There's a lot of monitoring on the sun's uh, burst because each one creates another wave. And each time we reach a certain combination, because it's like a combination, you're turning the dial and things are clicking in and then as soon as the planets all align a certain, a certain position, uh, now you've just created another pulse of activation, which is another cosmic ray, another cosmic uh, uh, vibration coming through that carry more changes. And guess what? Not only is the planet purging, everything is purging, Humanity is going through the same thing. Look at the emotions. Look at all the, the things that we are now starting to feel emotionally, physically, you know, health-wise and otherwise that are coming up, stuff that we never dealt with before. Given we are currently in the period of maximum excitability, it is not surprising that we have been seeing social action like the Turkish, Egyptian, and Brazilian uprisings during the year 2013. What's even more fascinating about our current cycle is that it is occurring during a time when NASA has also confirmed that the solar storms occurring in 2012 and 2013 will be of near unprecedented nature. On March 10th, 2006, NASA's website issued a solar storm warning for 2012. It stated, the next sunspot cycle will be 30 to 50% stronger than the previous one and its solar activity second only to the historic solar max of 1958. In June of 2010, NASA reinforces that original 2006 warning, telling the public to get ready for a once-in-a-lifetime solar storm. Dr. Richard Fisher, head of NASA's Heliophysics Division, stated, We know it's coming, but we don't know how bad it's going to be. But there is something even more special about our current cycle, and it may directly relate to the foretellings of the Mayans and the Egyptians since we know cosmic rays have an effect on human consciousness. At the center of our Milky Way galaxy, there lies a supermassive black hole whose mass is equivalent to four million of our suns. What is causing a great deal of excitement and interest in our scientific community is the existence of a gigantic plasma cloud called G2 that has been making its way towards the black hole at an increasing speed since 2004. Considering the gravitational pull of the black hole is increasing also, astrophysicists speak of a vacuum process causing the black hole to consume the plasma cloud. This has stretched out this mysterious plasma cloud, and as the black hole continues to consume the cloud, many are suspecting some very interesting things will happen. 
Some are saying that by the end of 2014, the black hole will consume enough of the plasma cloud and temperatures will reach such high levels that astrophysicists project that a massive eruption of cosmic rays will be sent in the direction of planet Earth. Science and history tells us that humanity's consciousness will continue to be affected by these cosmic rays. But what makes now so different from our past is that we have also begun a new world age that is characterized by ridding the old and bringing in a whole new experience. For this reason, it is likely that what we are seeing happen across the world is the quickening process of humanity awakening to a new consciousness. This will in turn encourage us to create a whole new way of living. Both science and spirituality are making it clear that something big is taking place in our world right now. Every sign is pointing to the fact that people are thinking differently and are feeling that something is changing. The issue is not many are sure what to do right now. So the question becomes, what role do we all play in the shift? With the world being the way it is today, it is clear that many of our systems and ways of doing things can't be sustained moving forward. In our journey, it seemed clear to us that the world was feeling this and people were trying to do something about it. As we looked to best understand what role we all play in the shift, we began looking into solutions that people were working on around the world. We came across people who are building new energy technologies, people who are starting sustainable communities and even people who are building and living in homes that were completely off-grid. For us, off-grid homes were an exciting possibility because it was proof that we can be living in homes that do not require any outside energy source. Come on in. So the Phoenix is 5,000 square feet, and it was designed so a family could four could uh, totally survive here without ever going to the store. As you can see, we've got a flat screen TV up there. We can have televisions and airships. We do have power. Uh, this is actually a fireplace and a waterfall at the same time, which is really fun to have the fire and water together. This house is really all about just incorporating the elements, just like airships are about harnessing natural phenomenon. An earthship is a completely off-the-grid home. It has no municipal power, water, or sewage running through the building. It's um, totally self-autonomous. Basically, there are all the modern amenities and no utility bills, which is awesome. Um, and the earthships are made out of mostly natural and recycled materials, or as much as we can possibly get our hands on uh, for them to still be functional. They're actually built with tires rammed with earth. Um, uh, the Earthship's filled with tires for several reasons. Um, one is that they're getting them out of landfills, which is awesome, because there are these huge like tire mountains that can be seen from space. Uh, so we need to do something with them. Um, but aside from that, they're an incredible structural material. Uh, they make up all of the structural load-bearing walls. They're earthquake-proof, they're fireproof. There's no off-gassing that takes place because they're so densely rammed with earth that there's no air. And then they're encapsulated in cement, so there's no light. Um, it's like a virtually indestructible wall, which is pretty cool. Uh, the buildings heat and cool themselves by design. Um, they stay about 68 to 75 degrees all year long with no heating or cooling. Um, and because of this, they can actually run off of very little power. All of the power is either solar or wind. Um, they contain and treat their own sewage. They grow their own food. Uh, they harness the sun and wind for power. Um, all of the water is collected on the roof, and they provide an amazing way to live. I mean, really, you know, if you don't have a mortgage and you don't have bills, you're almost there. I mean, you're almost free. It's incredible. Why do you think alternative solutions like these are not more well-known to the public? You know, lots of people that come through 
uh, the visitor center ask me, so why isn't everyone doing this? If this is so great, why isn't everyone doing it? And you know, I think it's a really good question because I don't really know the answer. Partly I think it's just a matter of education that people don't realize that this is possible. I'm doing it right now. The technology is here. It is totally possible. It works. I'm doing it now. And you know, more people, I think, the more we have, the more we talk about it, the more the ideas get out there, um, hopefully it will catch on. And also partly I think that people are locked in to a more traditional system. And so it's difficult for them to see outside the box, to think that way, to think that this would be possible for them. Earthships can absolutely be built on a mass scale. Um, you know, it's super exciting actually. We could have entire cities without infrastructure. You know, they wouldn't be prone to blackouts. They could be earthquake proof and fireproof. People could be living a healthy lifestyle, growing their food on site. You know, we wouldn't have to transport bananas from Ecuador. Everyone would be growing them in their living room. Um, and no one would have any bills. I mean, think about just the relief of not having to make those monthly payments. Like, and all of the wonderful things you could do with your time and your energy and furthering yourself and friends and family. And basically, I mean, not to get crazy with it, but the whole human race. I mean, you know, isn't it time that we stop and we get out of this cycle? What's most exciting about Earthships is the fact that the, the solution is there. It's, it's available now. There, there's not some drastic change that needs to happen in order for um, this new type of housing can be available. They've been around for many, many years and, and improvements are being made on them all the time, but ultimately those solutions are available now. You can live in a home that is completely off the grid, completely sustainable. You're not losing any of the modern amenities. Uh, I mean, you, you look at it and you think, oh, well, they're not that modern looking, which you, I could agree with. I mean, not, not every Earthship has the most modern look, but that doesn't mean you, can, you can't take a lot of the practices that uh, an Earthship employs and use it in more modern designs. The, the possibility is there, and I, I think that's the most important part and what got us most excited about exploring Earthships in the first place was that here's a solution that's available now. Our interest in Earthships led us to a man named Rob, who was living on his own land in an Earthship in Alberta, Canada with his family. Rob welcomed us onto his land and shared his journey of how he was led to make big changes in his life. Well, my view was, and still is, that at some point, um, we all kind of behave like children. And when we grow up, we have parents to help govern us and look after us. And they use benefits and privileges to help us, raise us through that process. And uh, about five, six years ago, we realized that our dependency on corporations and the government was very much the same as uh, a child's relationship with a parent. So we decided to grow, grow up and start working on removing those dependencies. And part of that was by re myself revoking my consent to being governed. And so I went through a process to serve notice to the government that I no longer wanted the governor general or the queen to govern me. I chose to have a one-to-one -one relationship with the creator rather than having the queen or some government agency govern me. And we started working on building this earthship so that we can start removing our dependency on corporations like for power and water and gas and, and that sort of thing. And part of that process was for us to do an inventory of where our dependencies were in our life and start working on knocking those off one at a time. And, and that's essentially what started uh, this project and, and how we got to where we are today. So our intent with the garden this year is to see what it's actually going to take to grow all of our food. Okay. So this is a big task because we're still dependent on the grocery store yeah. and we want to remove that dependency. So the big test now is to see how much food it's actually going to take. So I got probably about 500 hills of potatoes in here. We got peas. Still need to get in to do some more weeding. We spent hours and hours and hours in here, but you never know it. But 
Um, we have onions in here, with some lettuce. Grazing the chickens through the pasture here. These, these chickens we hatched this spring ourselves, like we hatch our own chicks, right? Uh, we're born in March, so April, May, June, July. They're like four months old and they're still not fully grown yet. Yeah. Right? Oh, they're cute. Some of them are just babies too, I guess, right? Yeah, they're about the same age. Aww. They're so cute. I don't think I've ever seen a baby chicken. And that's all DC, direct current. And then this inverter inverts that into AC, so I then can wire my house like a traditional house and run, you know, TVs, laptops, fridges, that kind of stuff. So our solar system's there. Um, we collect water off the roof and we channel it through these pipes here. And the cisterns are actually just underneath your feet. Then our water system, <coughs> just give you an idea, the bottom of the tanks is right here. So I can gravity feed water into the house if I wanted to. And I also put the water through a, a particle filter, UV filter, and carbon filter. And that's the water that you taste. Mm -hmm. And then I have a pump so I can pressurize the tank to run the washing machine and later on the shower once we get the showers done. The stove there we just burn in the winter time. The Earthship this far north would get to 10, 15 degrees in the winter time. So we just burn to just keep it at 20. But even if we didn't burn, it would never freeze in here. Just use some blankets and yep. <laughs> just a little warmer. Yep. If, push, deal, if right? push came to shove, we would survive in here in the winter time with no fire. While Rob's path may not be for everyone, it is ultimately a journey and decision he made from within. Interestingly, this led us to explore things on an even deeper level. In speaking to people we met, as well as engaging online with people from all around the world, we were led back to the core message that founded Collective Evolution in the first place. Change starts within. When Collective Evolution first started, it was founded on this idea that all the changes that we need to make here ultimately have to start within, within each and every one of us. And interestingly, when we traveled across North America and, and also spoke with people internationally, it didn't seem to matter whether they were working on projects that had to do with energy or, or housing or, or communities or anything that was going to create change in the external world. Ultimately, they all began, every journey began with a, with a shift that happened inside. Each person had this clear link that before they began doing what they were doing to, to appease something in the external world, there, there was some sort of consciousness shift that led them there. And that consciousness shift allowed them to see things in a different way so that when they're creating their solutions, they're actually creating it from a new level of consciousness altogether, which isn't going to repeat the same problems or the same issues or the same structures that we have today. Earthships are certainly not the only solution that can be explored nor is it all we can do right now. There are people all over the world who are working on bringing forward new solutions to the biggest issues we face right now. One of the most exciting areas of advancement is in the field of energy. It is no secret that our world needs to produce a lot of energy in order to function. Currently we are using old and outdated means to deliver most of that energy. With the solutions many are working towards and proposing as possible, Kicking the fossil fuel habit is entirely possible. While we could already be using alternative and renewable solutions like solar, wind, and tidal technologies on a more mass scale, free energy is another solution that is gaining more and more attention, and for good reason. Free energy technologies would allow us to produce limitless energy from the fabric around us, and it wouldn't cost us anything except for the initial production cost of the unit. Now to another good idea and imagine a machine that could power your house for free. Well that's exactly what two Australian inventors claim they've developed. Using magnets and a battery, their new generator has been described as revolutionary and foreign investors are lining up for a piece of the action. Chris Allen reports. So John, this is the machine? Yes, this is it, Chris. What's it capable of? Well, it'll, it'll power a house. This will, the machine will provide, provide sufficient electricity to run a house and have power to burn. 
It sounds too good to be true, but inventor John Christie is convinced his machine will change the world. So, John, basically you're saying this machine can produce five times as much power as it consumes. Yes, it, it does. This one, exactly as we see it, it does. And in fact, it can produce more than that. Once kick-started from a battery, John and his partner Lou Britz say this prototype will run for years without stopping, generating 24 kilowatts of power a day. You don't get more revolutionary, I think. I mean, we're talking about something that has the capacity to change the way that the world produces its electric power. It has the capacity to change the way that motors cars are, uh, are propelled. You can, you can replace the combustion engine, in fact. John, these are big claims. Are you sure you can live up to them? We don't really need to live up to them, Chris. What, what the, the technology speaks for itself. The issue is that there's a great debate over whether or not free energy is even possible. It is important to note that a big part of the problem lies in the fact that our current understanding of science and physics would have to change as a result of accepting free energy as possible. Another big issue is that the elite and big corporations have been suppressing these types of technologies for a number of years. You would think that a solution that could so radically change our world would at least be explored openly and honestly, instead of being violently opposed. Here's the challenge that we have. We don't yet have the technological breakthroughs that can completely replace fossil fuels. So for the next 10 years, next 20 years, we're still gonna be using oil. We're still gonna be using coal. We're still gonna be using natural gas. We're still gonna be using the traditional sources to fuel our cars, to heat our homes, to run our big power plants, etc. What I tell people is that the reason it's, it's, it's hidden in plain sight is that the establishment doesn't want people to know not so much that there's life out in the universe. There's two thirds of the public believes in it, that there's intelligent life somewhere out there. Uh, over half believe we've been visited, all right? Of the, and this is consistent in polls. It's the technology. How do you put something like that up in the sky and move it, no sound, completely quiet? You're not dealing with fossil fuels. You're not dealing with conventional rockets. You're dealing with an entirely new area of physics, which if it was disclosed would mean the end of big oil, the, bit of, the end of the petrodollar, the end of public utilities as we know it, it would be an entirely new energy paradigm. And so the macroeconomic power behind the secrecy is what no one's been looking at. And this is what the Minister of Defense of Canada and I did a press conference on a few years ago, Paul Hillier, and I did a, a press conference about this, that it's the energy and technology part of this story that has led to the extreme secrecy and also the extreme ridicule if the new energy technologies were to be set free worldwide, uh, the change would be profound. It would uh, affect everybody. It would be uh, applicable everywhere. Th these technologies are absolutely the, the most important thing that's happened in the history of the world. Aside from these technologies, there are a number of actions we can begin taking now that can make an impact on our world. Continue learning about how our world really works and spread this awareness to others. By knowing where we currently are and how we feel about it on a mass scale, we can begin taking action to peacefully move towards reshaping our worldview and creating new solutions. Use your money to show what type of world you support. Stop buying needlessly and purchase products that support the direction you would like to see the world go. Support organic and local foods. Support industries and solutions that are moving things forward instead of maintaining this current system. Use the power of numbers. Get together with others and begin performing actions together. Join under a cause or raise awareness about something that can help reshape our world. Having larger numbers shows the power we hold over the elite. Create community gardens and community projects that promote a better world. Getting to know those around you helps us remove barriers and differences that create the illusion of separation to begin with. We are all in this together. Opt out of the system in any way you can. The system requires our participation and support to keep it going. 
In our actions, we have all the power needed to have any aspect of our system changed. We are being manipulated to continue supporting the system and are made to feel powerless. It's time to realize the true power that we all have. Reflect on and be open to changing your consciousness or worldview. Is the world you see today really the world you want to live in? By asking ourselves questions like these and exploring the beliefs behind why we do so much of what we do, we can quickly make radical changes in how we see our world. This helps to create both conscious and action-oriented solutions to change the planet. Regardless of the apparent suppression of solutions to technologies that exist today, the most suppressed technology is our higher consciousness. We realize that no matter what solutions are proposed to change the state of our world, we must first change the current state of consciousness that exists within ourselves. A perfect example of this exists with Iceland. Remember how they revolted and overthrew their government to bring about change? While that came from seeing our world in a new light, ultimately, they did not shift out of the old paradigm, which is why in 2013, they re-elected their old government back into power. Most of what they had once rallied to change, they were now giving up. Our state of consciousness, or worldview, is what created our world to be this way in the first place. So in order to effectively change things for the long term, we must focus on the source, which is our consciousness. Simply put, the way we see our world, our beliefs about how our world needs to be, and even our beliefs about ourselves, need to change in order to change the world. Out of these new views, priorities, and understandings, we can put into place a fluid, open, and ever-evolving way of living. But with letting this go, guess what? I am now free to create completely new. And I'll tell you one thing, whatever you create now is fluid. Nothing is rigid. I am not building a structure that is solid and that cannot be movable. I am now creating a fluid moldable. So now our world will be like putty. Each time we can make adjustments along the way. It's not made out of concrete, it's set, we have to wait for it to deteriorate or we have to tear it down and then rebuild it again and there's a lot of planning. Now it's like this malleable substance that we can just make changes along the way. We want to make it shorter, bigger, taller, this and that, whatever it is. And that's the reflection of life that we're stepping into, is to make our life fluid and no longer defining ourselves with any form of rigidity. It's not, I am this. It's, you are pure potentiality. At this moment, I'm playing this role. This role, it will last whatever time I choose, and I'm not attaching to it, and I'm not defining myself by it. We have to realize first and foremost that the shifting that's going on is something that we agreed upon and it's not something that's forced upon us and it's not here to create more fear. So it's not to, to, to take the changes as something fearful but really to embrace it because we collectively and also individually have asked and have been waiting and have chosen to be here at this very particular time for exactly what's taking place at this moment. People are seeking out this information and even though we may feel alone because the external world is kind of promoted to seem that it's the complete opposite. That's what's pushed upon us through all forms of media, through all forms of entertainment to seem that everything is the opposite. But really things are progressing a lot more rapidly and it's a lot more widespread than that would ever suggest. This movement is growing like so fast. There are so many people that are becoming more and more aware of the, these things. And you'd be surprised, just talking to just a random person, you'd be surprised with how much people are starting to know. And people are just becoming way more aware and you don't need to feel alone. The more people start coming together and communicating effectively, the more we start working together and not let petty differences divide us, the more we just expand our horizons and not be afraid of questioning things or questioning ourselves the more the elites don't stand a chance in getting their agenda across. And I think we could live a life where it, it, it should be worth living. And it's all in our hands on how we wish to create that, how we wish to create our own lives around us. Just the small differences, the small things matter more than anything. 
we can't wait for the government or corporations to come up with the solutions because at the end of the day, they don't really want the solutions. We need to use uh, the consciousness of the people, the power of the people, the numbers that we have. We need to become leaders in this big change. But the new shift, the, the new paradigm works where each individual is their own leader and their own authority. And there's millions and billions of them, so you can't pull down their leader because there isn't one. Uh, I think that we've been conditioned to think that we're powerless. I think that we've been conditioned to think that the power lies in other people. And I think that we've been conditioned by a world that seems very dark and a lot of people might have given up hope, but that's all the power of persuasion. It's all a subjective opinion from the media and from, from the people that are creating this, this idea of what the world is. For many, a utopian view of the future is simply not possible. What we know is that 150 years ago, they would say that it was impossible for us to communicate around the world without being present and traveling for months and months on, you know, wagons. So the question is not if a utopian future is possible, but are we willing to accept a utopian future? As we're going along, as we let go of all the stuff that keeps us in, the, in, in this world of, of, of restriction, a, a world of materialism, the, the quicker you go with the changes. Part of this right now is coming together, like-minded people, and start to share more of this information and start doing the work. And the work is letting go of all, everything that you defined yourself by. I think a lot of people find themselves pushed to actually go inside and become this change themselves because without it, it doesn't take the same effect. It doesn't have the same impact on people, either ones in their immediate circles or the whole world, if they're not living it themselves. I would say that the, the most important thing is to learn how to not identify with your thoughts. Your presence, that's who you are. If everybody um, in the world starts to live a more conscious lifestyle, then we'll begin to see some major, well, we've already seen some major worldwide changes based off of everyone's consciousness raising and people just changing the way they're doing things. That's what's gonna create the big changes that we need to see right now. We fundamentally agree with the Beatles, and I think that like, you know, everything comes down to love and um, uh, you know, our, our capacity to love more openly and more fully is at the foundation of bringing any new world or new society into being that's, that's worth uh, enjoying. Live your life with love. Live your life with only love and not in fear. Because love is a very, very, the most powerful vibration. The duality of man is, is right in front of us. We have utter destruction and utter beautiful creation, like coexisting together. Which side is gonna win is dependent solely on you, the person watching right now. We sit in the midst of the greatest transformation we have ever experienced. Nothing can stop the shift that is taking place across our entire world. It's time to let the ways of the old go and begin exploring the new possibilities we are all aware of inside. It begins within each of us. It's time to support our creative ideas and visions. We no longer need to adhere to the old programs and beliefs we have been operating within for centuries. Together, we have the power to create a world that works for everything and everyone. This is true because the only ones who decide this is each and every one of us.
know 